It's time to build another amplifier. I know I said I wasn't going to do any more, but I've got the bug now. So Now, the main thing is, if you watched my last video on the so-called 100 watt per channel amplifier, which I built over five parts, I think it was, um, I had a number of people saying I didn't go into great enough detail because they wanted to follow along and build part if not all of the project. Well, I'm building this one with that thought in mind and I'm going to use the same box or same chassis, cabinet, whatever you'd like to call it, as I did on the previous one. Mainly because I want it to look like it's been professionally built because so many of us, and I'm sure you may be just as guilty as me, you can make something wonderful, it can sound wonderful, but it looks awful. It looks like it's been knocked up in the garage, which in many cases it has, of course. But there's no need for homemade equipment to look like that. So with that in mind, I've purchased already another cabinet, but it's not quite as easy as it first sounds. Take a look at this. Here's the front panel partially assembled but I have to say at this stage this is actually a reject panel and I've asked the distributor to send me a replacement one for the following reason. Now it's hard to photograph this without getting glare but there's parts missing on it. There's supposed to be a line round there and a line round there. Um, I, I, compared with the original one which I thought looked very professional. I don't know how well this is going to come out on the camera, but if you look at the word volume, you can see a shadow above and below where the jig has obviously slipped or something like that. And the letters themselves are sticking forward and they're rough. And to a lesser extent, so are the other letters, but the volume is particularly noticeable. On the front panel, you have this set button and three LEDs with the appropriate inputs marked. And to make it work, you simply press the button and it skips along to whichever input you want. This is the on-off switch, which again is supplied with the kit, so nothing else to buy there. It even includes the standoffs here, which you need to make sure that it presses correctly. And above it, which is not supplied, is a small hole for an LED which at the moment I've put in there and the only sensible way of putting it in there I used um, Araldite or, or something like that and you just pop the LED in there and at some point this will be fed from 12 volts off the power supply and what I, this is actually a blue LED I've used a red one before but what I shall do so that the colour balances I should put it on a 12 volt supply and you can't really calculate, I mean you can calculate the resistance to see how much current it's going to pass, that's simple Ohm's law basically. But what that can't calculate is how bright the particular diode is because you don't want it, some, as some of these diodes, I mean you can light up the room with them, it's ridiculous. So I shall experiment with the resistor and I shall tell you what value I use. But it will of course depend on what value and what colour LED you, chose, you choose to use. The um, LEDs on the front for the inputs are red LEDs. So you might choose to go for red, ED, red, red LED. You might choose to be able to speak properly as well, but never mind. Now when you come to purchase a potentiometer, there are many types available. Now this one is made by Alps and is generally regarded by most people to be one of the better potentiometers available. But the specification um, is basically that it should be a logarithmic 50k stereo pot, in other words dual channel. Now you can just buy the pot quite a bit cheaper on its own uh, but then you've got to mess with the fact that it's a, a printed circuit board connections and it always looks a bit of a mess. I've chosen to buy it complete with 
the small PCB which I've put on there and then you just simply connect to either pins or poke the wires in the holes and um, it then mounts straight to the front panel. Now the, the out pot is the correct diameter shaft for the front panel. I'm pointing to it but I know you can't see it. <laughs> oh dear. Certain of the other types, particularly the cheaper pots that you can buy, have a, a larger diameter which is no problem except you'll have to drill out the front panel. This one will fit straight into it, no problem. So it would be the one that I'd recommend. And this particular one also has linear travel. Um, the one I used on the previous module had a click indentation. It's made to make, make it look like a switch, but of course it isn't. It's the same pot with a sort of clicking arrangement. Um, this is better. This is what the panel should look like once assembled. The socket here is supplied with the kit and is perfect for the job. You don't get a plug and lead from it, so you need to purchase that as well. In here, there's a fuse. Well, there isn't a fuse, but you have to put one in there. And I would probably use a two amp um, slow blow. That would seem to, this is assuming you're using 240 volts or 220. The inputs are standard phono, or I think most people in America and the like call those RCAs, but to me they are phono plugs, and these are gold-plated ones. They don't cost much more than the standard ones, and all this stuff came from AliExpress, and there are hundreds of people supplying these. The speaker terminals, um, it depends on what you want, basically. They are pre-drilled, but I've not found any that fit this properly. I bought some initially and they just fell straight through the holes. These ones also came from a company on AliExpress and are gold plated. I'll show you the back in a minute. But I found in this particular supplier that two of these are faulty insofar as when you go to tighten the bolts up the um, centerpiece just pulls through. So I've complained about that and told them I want two new ones. And it seems like the red ones are faulty and the black ones are fine. Don't ask me, I mean, I mean the colour shouldn't make any difference, but when you look at them, they are completely different the way they're made. So the um, red ones at the moment are on here just to show you basically, and they will need replacing. The, this type of socket offers the advantage that you can Put your wire through the hole there and trap it that way or better in my opinion is to put a four millimeter, four millimeter plug in there which you can just pull out and here's one i've assembled earlier and you can see it goes in there a treat and then if ever you want to disconnect the speakers it's so easy just to pull that out and again these are these are dirt cheap this is how the back panel looks like from the back. Here you have the um, mains input and it's virtually self-explanatory. It's labelled live and neutral and whatever, so you can't really go wrong there. Here are the backs of the speaker terminals in the centre. And on the right is the module. Now, you need to listen carefully for this because when you buy this kit, this isn't supplied mounted so you have to actually put on um, what I what I've done is screwed these to the front panel and then the module pushes onto the back and then you just solder the positives if you like and then you have if I can hold it like that you have terminals on here and that's all ground I've earthed them all to each other and here on the board if you can see it here is the board ground from here so you just take a link from there and that will then earth it and it will go via this cable to the front panel but what I was getting at if you look at the photographs supplied on the internet with this cabinet it shows this mounted upside down now it will work upside down but 
the input will be reversed. Obviously, if you think about it, if you swap that module like that, it will be reversed. It will still work perfectly well, except when you select one input, it will be the opposite input. For example, if you select AUX in real terms, it will be CD. That will be right, because that's in the middle. So be aware of that. You need to connect it with the terminals at the top. If you don't do that, you will curse and curse and curse, because once you've assembled it, it's a pig to undo it. Now, as I said at the beginning of this um, short chat, or maybe it's a long chat, hopefully not too long, um, I said this is designed really f so that virtually anybody can assemble this and get good results. Now, I need to qualify that. If you have no electrical experience, this project is not for you. Um, A, you could end up killing yourself, which I would not like to happen. I can't teach people electronics. This is assuming people have a basic knowledge of electronics, how to solder, and basically how things, how, how things go together. Where possible, I've tried to use modules that are available in either a do-it-yourself kit form, which I would not recommend unless you are really quite experienced with electronics because just making a small mistake with the transistors around the wrong way or hopefully not electrolytics around the wrong way because that can be quite dramatic. You don't want to do that. So I would suggest that if you have little knowledge you can make this kit, you can make this project and providing you, you bear in mind if you, if you touch the switch mode power supply you could kill yourself and that's never good but if you have a little bit more knowledge and you can assemble a kit but bearing in mind if you do assemble it yourself um, you don't know unless you test every component you don't know whether there's a component faulty or whether you've assembled it fault, uh, badly either way it won't work and unless you have the knowledge to find out where the mistake is you throw that money away but there's a fairly good chance if you buy the ready assembled module and the modules which I'm going to suggest you purchase are ones that have all been tested hopefully um, and are well made and with, with good soldering so putting them all together you should be able to have a ready working project which you will be proud of and will, will be worth six or seven hundred dollars if you were to purchase a ready-made product this is the power supply i'm going to recommend it's the one i used on the other project of the other amplifier which i've just built the only difference being the other one was plus and minus 40 volts for the main supply and this one is plus or minus 50 volts because the amplifier would be more powerful so we need a higher voltage to get that higher wattage. Now I know that says 45 on there. Uh, that's because yours truly is an idiot. And because I've ordered the wrong voltage. Yes, I know. It, it's an age thing. I am nearly 70. I mean, you, you do get a bit stupid when you're this age. So ignore the fact that says 45 volts on there. Now when you come to mount this it has to be mounted on standoff insulators because obviously the PCB would short onto the bottom of the board we'll go into the details of this later but this is how it connects this is the outputs the center is zero volts and this output is the minus 50 volts or will be and this is the plus 50 volts. Now these are the other low voltages. This also gives you plus and minus 15 volts, which initially we won't be using in this project, so that will just remain blank. This is 12 volts, which we'll be using for some of the items in, in the project, so those will be in use. The only one initially will be used will be to light the LED. Now, when you order these power supplies, they come from a variety of people 
and I don't have any great allegiance to any one particular company. Some include postage and some exclude postage, but when you think nothing is free in this world, the ones that are cheaper, you're normally plus postage, and the ones that are slightly more expensive include postage. But please don't be gullible enough to think that someone's sending this all the way across the world for nothing. They aren't. And sometimes it's cheaper to pay the postage than it is to buy the one including postage. Anyway, that's for you to decide. Now, there's not much else I can say about this at the moment, um, other than I'm going to swap, uh, flip the board over and note this. Note these components here. And here is a mounting hole, okay? I'm going to swap the board over. Now these are the two connections of those small capacitors on the other side of the board. And they're linked together by that piece of track and then they go along here to apparently nowhere. Now this is one of the mounting holes. All the other mounting holes are either blank, in other words they mount into the board, but this is the only one that actually mounts with a, a, a track going to it. Now it's most important that when you mount that down you mount it with a, a metal insulate, metal insulate, no such thing, a metal standoff because that actually needs to be tied to ground. If you look at this part of the circuitry in general, this is all part of the, well apart from that um, component there which is the rectifier, these are all part of the noise immunity systems and if you don't earth that piece to ground these two capacitors along with this choke and this capacitor won't actually be doing the job properly. Now I'm going to talk about the amplifiers and the first bit of thing to notice is these modules which I'm going to show you any second are already assembled because in all honesty the difference in price between assembling both these boards and buying them pre-assembled was four dollars and quite frankly whilst I enjoy building things there's a lot of soldering and, and messing about on these amplifiers and four dollars I'd rather spend that on a coffee to be honest but this is how they arrived as you can see these are a pair of the output devices somewhat bent and mangled and that's because Let's zoom out a little bit. These were in a long, that's the other one. These were in a long piece of wrapped up material, but the ends were only had a bit of um, cling film or wrap or something around it. And the consequences are they've obviously suffered a little bit in transit. Now, whilst that's really annoying, and avoidable it's not the end of the world because with a long nose pair of pliers you, one can simply straighten these out. Now any amplifier really needs some sort of protection against you doing something stupid or something going wrong with the amplifier and there's probably a 50-50 chance of either of those happening so you need one of these. What this is is a delay circuit so that when you power up, it gives the amplifier that couple of seconds to settle down. And also when you switch it off, you get the, sometimes you can get distorted sound running for two or three seconds while the power supply sags and it sounds awful. So the idea of this is when you turn the power on, there's a delay of three, uh, two or three seconds. And then if all is well, the relays will click in and connect to your loudspeakers. The other thing this will do, which also is, is important, if it detects any voltage across the line that the speakers are going to, it won't turn on. And I'll show you some interesting ways I've tested this. Now, 
this is quite unusual. You'll, you'll find if you look on AliExpress and eBay and the, and the likes, there are quite a few different modules. I've used a different one in my first amplifier. This one, I think, only comes ready-made. I could be wrong, but when I was looking for one, I thought this is the sort of thing I could build relatively easily. But I don't think you can buy this as a kit. I could be wrong, but it's relatively cheap. This was $15 in New Zealand. So if you, if you bought a kit, I doubt whether you'd save more than two or three dollars. And the other important thing, on most of the other ones that you find on the, on the Ebays and the like, the negatives, this basically this is, this is how it works, inputs, outputs, or vice versa, I can't see here. Now that's output, beg your pardon, that's input. Obviously positive, negative, negative, positive of the various channels. On most of them, the negatives are put together, which you don't really want to do that. And in fact, on the amplifier I built previously, I didn't connect the negative to this at all, um, because I don't want the channels going effectively to ground through each other. Because of earth loops and things like that, you must really keep the channels completely separately. But we'll, we'll talk about this later when we start to assemble it. But basically, this is the module I'm going to use, and is the one I would recommend. Um, it actually costs, as I say, about $15, whereas the cheaper ones that don't have that facility and don't have the optical isolators, whatever their name is, um, they're, they're about $10, something like that. There's two of these heat sinks supplied with the kit, and basically it forms the left and right sides. And it is a very generous heat sink. What I will do is to drill the holes, tap them for M6, and that will be fine. That's what I'm going to do with the transistors. I haven't quite worked out what I'm going to do with these standoffs yet, but it's minor stuff. Anyone that can use a, a drill tap, a drill and a tap, shouldn't have an issue with that. Oh, I hate resistors bent over. That's a victim of the transport, I think. I have my first heat sink here and with the module after straightening the transistors I've marked out the holes and I've drilled them. For those that have never tapped a hole before a little bit of oil. This is a must. You must use oil even on aluminium. Start it making sure that it's parallel because otherwise the whole thing will just seize up. Now it's important if you've never done this before that you go, go slowly and also after every half turn relieve the turn and you can feel it sort of click when it breaks off the piece of swarth. Um, and this is how you tap the hole. Slowly making sure that's parallel. It must be parallel or you'll break the tap and you don't want to do that. And if this shows someone how to do this without breaking it, I hope I don't break it, that would be embarrassing wouldn't it? And luckily the holes have drilled right in between the veins of the heat sink so the tap will go straight through because the point of the, ta uh, the tap is tapered and although you don't strictly need to go all the way through because I should only be using about half the thickness of the aluminium or aluminium if you prefer. With the correct size drill bit this is an easy job to do but do make sure you've got oil on it. I use three in one oil but there's a million different types. It's just a thin standard lubricating oil. So now we wind it out. I've actually gone through much further than I need to but uh, and before you do anything again clean the tap 
and most importantly wipe off all the oil because it gets everywhere right well I'm not going to show you how to do any more because I'm sure that's giving you the idea I've got two more holes to drill now and tap on the other side the holes are drilled and tapped in the heat sink and these are the things we need next these are mica washers I left them on the bench because they're easier to see they're quite fragile so whatever you do don't bend them these go between the heat sink and each of the transistors and these are the screws I'm going to use and most important you must have this this is thermal grease heat sink compound it comes under a variety of names even different colors I tend to use white um, simply because you can see it easily against a black background don't be tempted to avoid using this this stuff is cheap you can buy it from China and probably your local shop electrical shop for pennies but you, you must use this otherwise the heat from the transistor won't give a good bond between the heat sink and the transistor and the next time the transistor gets hot it will blow up and that's the end of your project the end of your amplifier could even damage the power supply so don't forget to use this now there's quite a few ways of doing this everybody has their own way but this stuff gets everywhere so be a, be cautious of it this is what I do put a blob in the center and then with my finger health and safety will probably have a field day but just smear it over you will get in a mess for this guaranteed make sure it goes over the corner and and then place it over the hole incidentally before you've done this you must make sure the hole is deburred because if there's a burr on the hole when you tighten the screw down you could well end up with um, puncturing the mica washer which again not recommended end of the amplifier and the same with the other one I hope I'm in camera because I can't see what I'm doing here you don't need lots of this stuff I mean it, it just all it does basically is allow it to transfer the heat better because the mica washer is um, an insulator because you it will you want it to be electrically isolated but you don't want it to stop heat going through which is its purpose right that's that side done and now we need to well I tend now to put it on the transistors it doesn't really matter I guess there's no good putting it on the plastic because the plastics an insulator anyway so you just cover the transistor and I will do the same on the other side off camera because now you've seen me do it you don't really need to see me doing it again right the boards laid down on the heat sink I've put the screws in all that remains now is to screw them up don't do them tight at this stage just make sure they go in easily and you you don't puncture the mica washer so always line the mica washer up first and the screw should literally go in straight away you shouldn't have to force them or anything like that everything seems fine so it needs to be tight but equally not too tight you can see some of the heat sink compound squidging out so you know that it's 
that's about right. And do the same thing on the other side. All that remains to do on there is to remove any excess heat sink compound. The board itself does have some extra mounting screws here and here and the same on the other side but that's rock solid. That really doesn't need any extra screws. I really don't think there's any point you can see if I give you this angle. It's all clear underneath the board so you need to make sure that none of the screws are touching the heatsink and you can try flexing it. You can see there's, there's virtually no movement on there. So I'm not going to put screws in there. That's going to be fine. I'm really happy with that. Only one thing left to do and that needs your test meter. I've got the test, test meter set to buzz. You don't need to see the meter because you will hear it. Now obviously the point of a mica washer is to insulate the transistor so if we go on here you expect that to make a contact because it's going through the transistor but what it shouldn't do is to have a connection between any of the connections on the transistor and it doesn't so that proves we've insulated the transistors from the heat sink. If it, if it did buzz, it means you've either pierced the mica washer or there's a short somewhere, a tiny bit of solder or something like that. But that's a test you must do. There should be no connection between any of the components and the heat sink. Well, it's, it's uh, lash up time now. Um, as you can see from the module there, it's now mounted on the heat sink and it's acquired a bird's nest. Here we have the load box. Here we have the meter, which is going to measure, hopefully, the right amount of volts. Here we have a temporary power supply, which is plus or minus 45 volts because I'm still waiting for the 50 volt one to come, but it will still work fine. Um, but power will be somewhat limited obviously. On the computer we have VLC player booted up and it's running a loop of one kilohertz as you can see from the blue line going across it it's looped and I've checked that it's coming out of the computer and going in to the amplifier. I've now reduced the sensitivity on the scope and the scope is looking at the output and I'm going to stand back and apply power and I shall look at the scope because if all is well you should see a nice one kilohertz sine wave on there not distorted and um, hopefully you won't hear any explosions or anything like that I've got the meter connected across the two supplies so we should see round about 90 volts across the whole thing so if if all these parameters are right there's a fairly good chance that everything is is okay I'm taking a chance here of switching it on for the first time on camera now this could be the most amusing video you've ever seen uh, when you see me with the fire extinguisher but hopefully from my point of view it doesn't make a very good video i know but fire and smoke is always good for for a laugh but we're in front of the scope and i've only got to flip the power now and hopefully fairly instantly we should see a sine wave well that's very encouraging let's have a quick look round at the meter ah and of course you can't see it because of the glare how can we do this? 98, 99 volts. Well, that looks pleasantly encouraging. Well, all seems to be okay. Um, I've removed the signal, and this is the quiescent current of the plus side, and 
obviously I've also checked the other side off cam because it's exactly the same except it says minus on the meter so I would have said that was a fairly acceptable quiescent current right one last quick test before I start um, doing some proper stuff later on we're just going to wind the power up at the moment we've got it connected to the dummy load which is toasty and nice and I'm going to up the signal until we see clipping which is about there now, I don't know if it's a scope clipping because it's on the maximum input at the moment but that corresponds to let's just do some quick calculations divided by 8 ah well that's 106 watts 